1. I live in a little town near Barcelona. This town, thought well connected with civilization, is very small and surrounded completely by the woods. I moved here about seven years, when I was thirteen, ago due to familiar reasons, and I stayed here since then. I remember when I started at the local high school, some of my classmates were talking about a species of ghost with the appearance of a black and thin figure, which appeared near the twilight. Occasionally they commented to each other on these encounters they had from time to time, between terror and fascination. These conversations were repeated in different social circles and even different ages. I spent five years in that institute, and I have even heard a teacher commenting on it. They referred to him, we treated him as a man, by several names, depending on who you ask, but the most common was El Ombra, the Shadow, in Catalan. At first I assumed it was a local legend, because I live in a town that has a strong medieval history related to witches, but I have not found anything related to an elongated silhouette. All this story was foreign to me, I had never had a similar experience, but many people who had not suffered this either totally believed in Alhambra. I must also say that all those of us who have doubted their existence have spent our childhood out of town, without hearing anything of Alhambra. This added to this strange daily life with which the subject is treated, made that in the end this happened to have had a certain respect, although at the beginning I laughed about it. I learned to live with it over time. Then two weeks ago I had my first appearance. It was about 7 p.m., and I took the dog for a walk. My village, starting at approximately 6 p.m., becomes a ghost town. You can only see activity in one of the two bars we have, or people taking their animals for a walk and going shopping. I was on a road a bit badly paved. It led to a small park where there is usually no one at that time, and so let the dog run freely. On that path, I began to feel horrible discomfort. My ears began to whistle, and I started to cough. The orange light of the sun began to enter my eyes as if my pupils had dilated enormously. Then I looked up and saw, very difficult because of the light, a black silhouette elongated against the light. I almost had a heart attack, and my legs trembled so much that I fell to my knees. I got up as best I could, and went home as best I could. Honestly, I do not know if it was real or just a coincidence made by my mind and the condition of my senses at that moment. But that night I hardly slept two hours. And finally, three days ago, walking the dog, I found, near a forest area, a man in the distance, dressed in a reflective vest. He yelled at me and said, Hey boy! He approached me, and I saw that in the vest he wore the words, Guardia Civil. He was from the Civil Guard, the Spanish military police. That scared me. Basically because if the civil guard was there, it was for something. Since in Catalonia, the police functions are fulfilled by their own police force. He kindly asked me not to continue there, that they were working. He did not say anything else. And I went back. While I was leaving the semi-forested area, I found a civil guard going in the direction from where I was coming, accompanied by two others, in uniform and armed with what I believe is a rifle. I do not know much about weapons. It disturbed me a lot, like when my family explained it, but I did not relate it to Lilombra. The next day, with some friends, one of them, whose father was a local policeman, explained that a civil guard had disappeared without leaving any trace in the area of my town. I do not know if it has anything to do with the above, but I am quite scared. 2. My house was brand new when we bought it. No one has ever lived there before us. We live in a very small and quiet one-street subdivision outside city limits, so to our knowledge there has never been a house on this property before. When we were signing the paperwork, there was a statement we had to sign that said it had never been an Indian burial ground. I thought that was kind of weird, but it's probably something they put on all house paperwork nowadays. We are a military family, and my husband sometimes has to be gone for days and months at a time. During the first four years of our marriage, I was also in the military. I deployed a couple of times, and he went on ten-day trips overseas every month at least. We have been apart a lot. I'm definitely used to it. Besides double-checking the doors and windows before I go to bed at night, I have no problem being alone, not counting kids. 
About a year after we moved in, in 2014, when my son was four, my husband had to leave. I don't remember now if he was deployed or was just going to be out in the field for about a week or so. Whatever the reason, he was gone. A few nights after he had been gone, everything was going on as usual. I went through the bedtime routine with my son, giving him a bath and getting him into his PJs, read him a bedtime story and tucked him in with his poo bear that he had had since he was a baby. He always slept with Pooh and hardly went anywhere without him. I checked all the doors and windows as usual, then tried to decide if I wanted to spend all of my precious kid-free couple hours before bed reading, or take a shower and lose some of that time. I decided on the shower. When I got out, dried off and wrapped up in a towel, I walked into my bedroom to get dressed. I had just reached the side of my bed where my dresser was. Some lights were still on in the house, including the living room, but it was quiet. Quiet enough that I heard little footsteps coming from the hallway toward the living room. Across the room opposite to where I was standing was my bedroom door. It was wide open and I could see into the living room. The footsteps continued and when they reached the living room I wasn't surprised to see my son. He was the only one in the house besides me after all. He was in his PJs and holding his poo bear in his arms like he usually did. I thought maybe he had a bad dream and was coming to me for comfort. But about the same time this thought crossed my mind, instead of coming toward my bedroom door, he turned and walked calmly and slowly through the living room toward the kitchen. There were lights still on in the kitchen, so I figured he probably thought I was in there. I called his name and hurried out of the room he didn't answer. I called him again and looked around the living room before going into the kitchen. Both rooms were empty, and he didn't answer when I called his name. That was really unlike him. I checked the only other room in that end of the house, the laundry room, but he wasn't there. Perplexed, I turned and began checking the other end of the house, even though there was no way he could have gotten past me without me seeing him. I finally checked his room, and he was laying in his bed with his poo bear sound asleep. With the way my house is set up, there is no way he could have gotten to his room without me seeing him, unless he crawled on the ceiling above me. Furthermore, at the age of four, he would never go back to his bed on his own after getting up at night. Anytime he got up, we would have to walk him down to his room and tuck him in, unless he had a bad dream or was scared, in which case he would end up sleeping in our bed. His room is at the end of the hallway, and even though we had put nightlights in every socket... He was always scared to walk down there by himself after dark, even if the lights in the hallway were on. If we didn't go down there with him, he wouldn't step foot in the hallway. This continued until he got a few years older. I have told this story to a few people. The rational, debunking explanations are always, I had been dreaming or my eyes were playing tricks on me. Well, I had just gotten out of the shower, so I was completely awake. If I had only gotten a brief glimpse out of the corner of my eye, I could agree that it was my eyes playing tricks. But because I had heard the footsteps, I was looking straight out into the room when I saw him walk by. It wasn't a brief glimpse. I saw him for a few seconds. This incident didn't scare me at all. I was more confused than anything. I had seen my son walk by, but then found out that he had been asleep the whole time. I thought for a while I might just be losing my mind, but nothing even remotely similar has happened in the five years since then. I don't know what I saw that night, but it wasn't my son. 3. In college, five years ago, I was in a fraternity. And the fraternity house was built sometime in the early to mid-1800s, around 1850, I think. It was all white, with tall, two-story columns and wood panelling. It was added onto in the 1970s to house the increased number of people living there. Anyway, the original house and property used to be a plantation. It had a rock wall surrounding the lawn. Not sure if it was original from the plantation days or added after. But it was in total disrepair, as in not even a wall anymore. Just a line of piled rocks around the place. The house itself had a parlour with a piano in it to the left a library to the right and a fireplace in the centre facing the library, with a staircase attached when you walked in. There were five bedrooms upstairs and another bedroom and apartment type downstairs, 
near the back of the house that our house dad lived in, but was probably a servant's quarters originally. We knew for certain that there had been one death in the house and possibly a second. The property owner's son put a shotgun in his mouth and killed himself in the parlor. When they still owned the property, which was a good 90 years before it became a fraternity house around 1940. Now that you have some idea of what this house kind of looked like, I'll get to the story. It was finals week at the end of the semester. When anybody had to study, they generally used the library at the front of the house as it was away from the bedrooms and somewhat quiet. It was a 12 foot by 12 foot room, the walls lined with old smelly yellow paged books and had a round table with four chairs in the middle of the room. I was pulling an all-nighter with one other kid, Teddy, and nobody else in the house was awake. Not the original part of the house anyway. I would be able to hear the floors creak and the walls were thin enough to hear conversations in rooms upstairs from downstairs, and was sitting in the chair with my back to the window and facing the fireplace that you pass when you walk in. The mantle of the fireplace had a few candles on it, and maybe a fake plant in the center. Teddy says he's going to get his cigarettes from the dorm and leaves. So I go back to studying on my own. I look up, and I see this one candle on the fireplace mantle moving back and forth like a metronome. The things used to keep the beat for a piano. The base of the candle was firmly planted on the mantle beam, but the candlestick itself is just moving back and forth, not like swinging but it would lean to one side, rest, and then begin to slowly move back over to the other side and repeat. Perplexed, I got up and stood in front of the candle and watched as it did this. Like a foot in front of my face. I'm thinking there must be a window open, so I go around the room and check that all the windows and doors are shut, and return to the candle again. Then I think that it must be rolling around the rim of the candle holder, Sort of how you can move a straw around in an empty cup. But it wasn't rolling around the edge, it just went from leaning to one side slowly standing upright, and then leaning to the other side at 45 degree angles. So I'm standing there just staring at this thing, when Teddy comes walking down the hall asking if I'm ready to smoke. I look at him, then back at the candle, and it's upright again and not moving. I asked him if he saw it, and he said he only saw me staring at the mantle as he was coming down the hall. I still haven't found an answer as to how the candle could move like that, but I didn't want to go around talking about it and get made fun of. But I did casually ask around if anything has ever happened to anyone else in that house, and I only got two answers. The first was that sometimes people heard the piano playing music, when no one was in the parlor, and the second was from the president of the fraternity. He was required to stay in the house over winter break to make sure that the heat was on, pipes wouldn't freeze, basic maintenance stuff. He said that after everybody left for winter break, it snowed, not much, maybe two or three inches. On his fourth night there on his own, he heard a knock at the front door, not that uncommon. So he goes to open the door and nobody is there. Except there's footprints in the snow leading up to the door. And no footprints leading away. He said he grabbed his bags and left and didn't go back until the rest of the students started showing up for spring semester. 4. Before I can get to the meat of this story, I need to give context to my living situation at the time. It was 2003 and I was 10 years old. I lived with my mother, stepfather and, counting me, two brothers and two sisters all younger than me. It was a turbulent time as my mother and stepfather's relationship and marriage was deteriorating, leading to violent shouting matches and fights. Overall, what I am trying to say is that my living situation wasn't great, and it may have had a knock-on effect with my young mind. To get to my bedroom, you'd go up the stairs, and mine would be the first door on the right. Across from it was the bathroom, and further along down the hallway was my sister's and parents' rooms. This part is important as no one else's bedroom was in the way who I could have mistaken for this entity. One last thing is my bed. I had a bunk bed. For the last few months, I had been waking up somewhere between 2 and 4 a.m., sometimes from nightmares and other times from fights. On this night, it was quiet and I laid in bed. Thankfully, the bathroom light was on as I was notorious for being scared of the dark. I remember looking out from my bedroom into a small slice of the hallway and I saw it. A large, shadowy figure that must have been at least six foot tall with a wide-brimmed hat. The way he was angled, I only saw half of it. 
and it would have been impossible to stand as he would have fallen down the stairs. Strangely, though, I didn't feel threatened and he didn't do anything to me. Sure, I was uncomfortable and I saw him for many months, but I got the impression he wasn't interested in me much, but I also got the impression I was not to look away when he stood there. I recall one night the bathroom light was off, and I had woken up. Fear had set in instantly. I really feared the dark at this age. So I got up quickly and quietly, tapping my feet on the bathroom and switching the light on. After using the bathroom, I, instead of going back to bed, just stood at the top of the stairs where the shadow figure would usually be, looking down into the dark. I looked down the stairs into the dark as far as the bathroom light would emit, and then I felt the feeling of being watched. It was subtle at first, but it was growing. I couldn't find the words for it at the time. I can best describe it now as feeling like a cornered animal who was about to get pounced on by a predator. I ran back into bed, running up my ladder to my bunk, and laid in bed, and there it was, the shadow figure, in the same place, watching me. I don't remember anything after this, though I recall many times the bathroom light was off. I'd run from my bed to switch the light on, and run back to bed, this time making sure not to hang around. I kind of felt like the light keeps it at bay, and it can't hurt me as long as the light is on. On the final night I saw it, it seemed different. I didn't feel scared of it, like usual. It instead seemed to comfort me, like I felt at ease. This memory has always confused me as this entity made me uncomfortable. But here it was now seemingly giving me a comfortable feeling like everything was going to be okay. The fights, the arguments, the screaming would all pass and things would get better. A few days later, in early 2004, my mother, in rage against her husband, burnt the house, destroying my bedroom, her bedroom, the bathroom, and the kitchen. It was after that day I didn't live there again, and after some strange period of foster care and being separated from my brother and sisters, I came to live with my actual father in Easter of 2004. It was only in the last few years I had learned of the shadow man with the hat and learned it was an omen of bad luck, though it seems it wasn't for me, and I have to wonder if it was targeting the parents. Lastly, I have been asked if I confused it for something in my vision, and frankly, that isn't very possible. The hallway was a lurid yellow and blue. My mother had terrible color combo choices, with a small window. I could see with nothing in the way that could be mistaken for a black hat shadow man. Even then, I never saw anything like it during the day only during 2 to 4 a.m. Five. In summer 2008, I used to stay at my mother's on weekends. On this particular day, she was out and practically lived at her friend's flat, leaving me with some much needed quiet time in her flat. Now, before I go on, I'd like to give the layout of this flat. When you enter through the only front door, you're presented with a short, narrow hallway where, at the end, is two doors. The one ahead goes into the living room, which leads into the kitchen and bathroom, while the other immediately on the right went into a small bedroom. I need to stress how close these doors were, how you could literally go from one to the other with just one step, and how narrow this hallway was, as you couldn't hide in it. Now to the event. I was sitting in the living room watching Spaced, Good show, I suggest watching it, Simon Pegg fans. Where I was also browsing on my laptop when I felt a palpable weight in the room. It was like the crack of lightning before a thunderstorm. In my weird logic, I thought, oh, I must be a bit tired. So I laid back on the sofa facing the TV and closed my eyes. Only just for a few moments. Then I felt it. The feeling of being watched. I opened my eyes and stood before me was a six-foot shadow figure in full view. It's very strange seeing a shadow figure in full view. It looked human, but definitely masculine and had no details, like a rough black blob had been melted into the shape of a human being. It was darker than black somehow, absorbing all light from the room and just stood there looking down at me. I freaked and jumped back on the sofa, sitting up. I blinked and it was gone but there was another in the hallway on the doorframe to the living room peering in. A smaller child-sized shadow figure that peeked from around the corner and smoothly it removed its hand from the doorframe and went behind the door, vanishing from my view. Now the first shadow scared me, the second shadow 
fucking terrified me. Why? Because it was a child-sized one, and also it was between me and the only front door out of the flat. After sitting in that position for what must have been like ten minutes, looking down the hallway, and Simon Pegg being ignored, I got up and just peeked. The bedroom door was shut, and any figure that stood there looking at me would have been literally cut through by the door. On one hand, I wanted to open the door and peer inside, but either the fear or a gut feeling told me, don't open that door. I left for the day, going to Mum's friends and stayed there till late evening. Still one of the most freaky shadow figures to happen to me. Again, I think it was attached to my mum, as they only seem to occur when I'm around her. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 135. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use and sent in stories for use in this video. I'm going to make this outro super duper short as I have an issue I need to deal with regarding my channel. Uh, essentially, I think all the tags on my channel are okay. I think they're for the most part anyway. But I want to go through every single video, that's over a thousand of them, and just either check and quite frankly in most cases probably just repl replace them with ones I know for a fact are safe to use. Because I'm seeing people running into issues regarding metadata, uh, which generally refers to your tags and things like that. Uh, so uh, I, I want to avoid any issues, and I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna change change them and make them safe, uh, just to be sure. Okay, and with that I'm gonna head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>